a senior lecturer and a researcher in the Department of Economics and Finance. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much for inviting me. Appreciate it. Uh, Prof, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Well, uh, I, I've always been someone that's, that's curious. And um, uh, I suppose I can trace it back to my, my youth. Uh, I, I always used to ask questions and no one gave me answers that I would, was happy with and so I would always read up on, on things or, or watch videos, although videos weren't as common as what they are now with YouTube. But um, I've always been someone curious and I, I worked in the, in, the, in the financial services industry, in the banking sector, and I realized that I had to reevaluate what I wanted to be and I always wanted to come to academia. And when that opportunity arose in 2003, 2004, I took it because I'd always wanted to do my PhD and there were always things that were bothering me that I wanted to, wanted to know more about. So to answer your question, throughout my career, curiosity has been at the forefront of, of, of my, my love for research. Thank you so much, bro. And then what are you currently working on? So at the moment, I, I'm busy with a few projects. I, I have one with uh, colleagues at the university, at a university in Salzburg, Salzburg University of Applied Sciences. Uh, we are looking at the impact of uh, the current environment post-COVID on family firms in South Africa. It, it's, it's a topic that hasn't been dealt with that much in our country. But in, in especially the Germanic countries in, in Europe, or well, the Germanic speaking countries in Europe, uh, a lot of the research deals with uh, family firms. And I think also the, the, the situation we are facing in South Africa with high unemployment uh, and economic growth that's really stifled, it's one avenue of growth that we can pursue more as a, as a scholarly uh, uh, or specialization in, in economic management sciences to, to promote job creation and, 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 and venues of growth. I also have a few personal projects that, that are specifically talking to the relationship banking dynamics. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the research in the banking sphere uh, doesn't touch on the, uh, or dare I say, the softer side of it, the, the relational side of it. But it's extremely important, especially in this world we're entering that is more technolo technology driven, uh, more focused on not having a personal human interaction because of technology. So I, I enjoy looking at that dynamic, you know, that the relational side. Interesting, there was a study that I came across. It's the longest longitudinal study, as far as I know, uh, currently from 1938 by Harvard University and, and what they're doing is it's a study based on happiness and they've they've plotted the behavior of uh, I think it was 240 odd participants in this, this study right from when they were young teenagers in, in, the, in, the, in the 50s many of them have obviously died in the interim and they've had kids and it's been it's been uh, extended to include the kids but the, the one finding that that study, uh, that came out of that study rather, was that the, the biggest predictor for happiness in life is not health necessarily. It's not your job. It's the relationships that people have. And um, I've always felt that that's the, the essence of why, why we are who we are and what drives us as human beings and the, the, the importance of community, the importance of, of, of uh, um, having someone to have as a, as a, uh, a person to, to uh, you're going to have to edit this. Uh, <laughs> um, the importance of community, the importance of having soundboards, the importance of having uh, someone you can ask for advice 
uh, on, on a more professional level, but in a, in a personal capacity, your, your spouse, your kids, your, your, your parents, whatever, there's something, there's something about that social dynamic of relationships that I, that is important, but in a sense counterintuitive in a banking relationship, because it's black and white, it's clinical, it's, it's, it's hands off in many ways, you know. Um, but I don't think it needs to be like that, and I think the success of banks, especially those with branch networks, okay. lies in that, and, and, and I'm trying to capture what that is exactly. A few other projects, I have uh, PhD students that have graduated and master students, we look at a few papers from their work. So what I'm busy with, quite a few things, um, but that's the life of an academic, you know, our, our brain never sleeps, and my wife always tells me that I need to sleep and switch off, but I, I've managed to fool her by closing my eyes, but I'm still thinking about my research. Okay, thank you so much, bro. And then coming back to the banking sector, do you think that banks are playing their role in advancing uh, social responsibility? Look, I, I think any any corporate institution can, can always do better. It's always a balancing act. On the one hand, you know, you've got to keep the interests of the shareholders in mind, or, but on the other hand, you, you cannot engage in any practices that are not in the best interests of, of, of communities, of society, of, of the environment that you function within. Are they doing enough? They, they can probably do better, but I don't think that they are not doing enough. I think you know, on a, on a practical level, in, in the, you know, the ESG reporting that, that's required now universally across the world, really, they've moved towards more ethical disclosure of what they do, how they do, in what context they, they give, where they give, etc. Um, and also, uh, the impact they have on, on, on society in terms of, of carbon emissions, if that's the particular case. In terms of banks, not necessarily. One thing that you know, there's always been a, a topic of discussion in the financial services industry in general, is the move towards digitalization and the move away from paper. Now, that's an interesting thing because on the, you, you, the banks need to have record of, for example, your signatures. I can recall when I worked in the bank many years ago, we used to have little filing cabinets with everyone's signature. Right? You know? Now, it's all digitized, sure. Um, but you still need to sign a document when you open an account. Yes, not always the case that, that, that it's a physical piece of paper, it might be digital, fine. But I think in terms of paper wastage and, and, and how that's managed, maybe the banks can, can do better. In terms of community involvement, if, if you look at the sponsorships they give in terms of different sports, you know, that's, that's something that is very clearly uh, uh, prominent. You, you tend to associate certain sports or certain events with particular banks. Uh, when it comes to mind is the Net Bank Golf Challenge, for example, um, and different banks, the, the, the soccer, uh, cricket standard bank. Uh, so they, they can always do better, um, but it's always going to be a balancing act. Uh, and, and, and that needs to be at the heart of, of, of how they approach this and how they are seen as well. If you look at the reporting that they give, that corporates have to comply to now. The the sustainability report, for example. You know, I always used to think back at when I was at the bank. You know, the annual report was a thin little document. Now, if you have to print that whole report, it, it, it's it's an absolute waste of paper. It's all digital because it's so thick. Just the sustainability report would be longer than would be more pages for for example than what you would have. Uh, for an entire annual report, say 20 years ago. So there's a lot more disclosure, there's a lot more focus on, on, on advertising what they do in terms of community settings, the, the value systems that they drive as, as financial institutions, especially on the back of you know, the global financial crisis of 2007, 8, and crises before that that have largely emanated or started in the banking sectors. So, so banks know that they have a responsibility in terms of ethical behavior, um, you know, that, that kind of dynamic, but also in, in the South African context, what they apply to communities and the youth. We have a huge unemployment problem with uh, youth. 
you know, ages 15 to 24 odd, you're looking at, at an unemployment rate of 61, 62%. It's exorbitant, you know. Um, whereas if you if you have a qualification, that a bachelor's degree, that drops to around 8, 10%. So um, the community service and the and the, um, the, the, the what they apply into the, in, into the youth is not only a function of the practicalities at a, at a communal level, but it's also do they offer graduate development programs? Do they offer opportunities for graduates to enter um, and make a career with, with, with the institution and um, become part of the solution rather than the problem? Okay, thank you, Doc. And then looking at the sustainable development goals, Goal number eight it talks about decent work and economic growth. Like now in South Africa, we are facing a, a distressed economy. Then are there any mitigation that can be put in place to resuscitate the economy? It's a tough one. Um, our economy is pretty much dead at the moment. Um, the, there are many factors at play. We, we probably need an entire day to go through all the factors, but you, you have the central bank that has an inflation target, and their motive is to, is to anchor inflation expectations. So in other words, what we want is, what they want, is they want to create an environment that is conducive to economic growth. Unfortunately, the policy that they put in place is driven primarily through the interest rates. And at the moment they are increasing interest rates and, and what that means is it's inherently restrictive because it makes the cost for fund, cost for finance, if you want to get a loan for example, cost of debt higher. Which means that many more people, many more institutions will pay more for debt and or will not qualify for loans. And these loans are a source or a means to acquire wealth, for example, and, 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 and create more capital investment. So that's the one side of it. The other side of it is you've got a, um, a, a government that is inherently um, inept at doing what it should do in terms of service delivery. It's not coming to the party. There's so much politics involved. And, and it's to the detriment of the poor. The middle class can, to some extent, shield themselves to all the problems we're facing, or most of the problems we're facing at least, but the poor can't. And that plays into prices, it plays into inflation, that plays into load shedding, it plays into uh, the quality of water and what's going to happen with that. So, potholes, you know, we, 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 we talk about potholes and it's a, it's a physical manifestation besides ESCOM and that, 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 that dynamic, but you know, when you see potholes, it signifies a lack of um, of basic maintenance. But it also signifies the fact that um, it's not seen as a priority, and there are many costs that are not, you know, that are in the background, sunk or hidden costs. Your tire, for example, that gets burst, that burst when you run out of a pothole. It happened to me a few months ago. I was riding on a national road, next thing, my, my tire bursts, and I'm sitting here in the middle of nowhere without a tire. You know, though, you, I mean, you can, that's one example of it, but when you look at ESCOM, when you look at the fact that the lights don't stay on, when you look at the fact that, that small businesses have to ensure that they keep the fridges on because the food might go off, you know, those are the, 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 the hidden costs in the background that just aggravates people even more and create, and, and, raises the level of frustration and, and anger. So you've got the government on that side and there's political politicking as it, as it were in government as to the power shifts that are happening in a, leading up to an election year. You've got the central bank on the other end. Then you've got the foreign sector. And they're looking for revenue. They're looking for a turn. They're looking for stable economies. You've got all these role players, these economic agents, and they all have different, but mostly uh, similar interests, financial interests, maybe is, maybe not the right word. I don't want to go down the route of of, uh, 
uh, corruption and uh, that whole rabbit hole. But um, the challenge is we don't have strong leadership. We don't have decisive leadership because of all of this. And it, it's, it's, it's heading towards a situation that I, I hope we can recover from. We, we should not shy away from the opportunities that privatization can offer in various capacities in, with regards to several SO, SOEs. I understand the political dynamic, I understand that side of it, but we are at a point now where we need to make a decision. Because if we don't do it soon, I, I worry that we won't be able to recover. And that's what worries me. We can push it so much that there's going to come a point where we can't recover from it. And then we are in trouble. Not that we aren't already in trouble. And there are many manifestations of this in terms of the exchange rate. You can see where the exchange rate is going. The, the rand, the dollar, the pound is weak. And I always say the exchange rate is a, a manifestation of the world's view on our economy. It's almost like a share price for South Africa. And that's the problem that we're facing. There, there, there's too much uncertainty, and at the heart of it is indecisive leadership. And that's my biggest concern. So to answer your question, we, we do have, there are options, but I just feel that we are not taking them. I don't feel that we are not taking them. And we are focusing on issues that are not going to get us out of this problem. Um, we need to act quicker. Coming back to research, are there any <clears throat> exciting gaps within your field of study? Yes, uh, to touch my earlier point, I think without a doubt the, the, the effect of technology on, on the banking sector, the banking industry, on financial services in general, I, I just published a paper now that's coming out since forthcoming with, with a former MBA student of mine that looked at, at how uh, a simple thing like rewards and loyalty programs in the digital space, the online space, how that influences the, the perception of value that these customers get from their banks. You know, and one thing that, come, that came out clearly was the role of technology and the value associated with convenience, with lower pricing structures, etc. You've got your whole computer, you've got your laptop in your phone now. It's, it's, it's simple. Um, so technology and, 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 and sub-focus areas of that relate to, for example, fintech, financial technology. Reg tech is another one, regulatory technology. How do we use technology in the regulatory space? Uh, we've all recently had to complete the Poppy Act um, questionnaire as a university. That's important because we need to protect data. We need to ensure that our personal data is protected, uh, that, that it's not breached, that we store it well, safely, etc., etc. So in the, in the financial services space, in the banking industry in particular, you can think uh, that that's extremely important because there's a lot of uh, very sensitive information with regards to your salary, your, your, your sources of income. I mean, you can just think if you fill out an application form, there's a lot of information there that, that's confidential. So, without a doubt, technology, um, when you think of chat GPT and what that brings to the equation, you are specific in the banking sector, but from an education point of view and what we're facing at a university, the, there are very real challenges there. Um, but that's just the manifestation of this move towards artificial intelligence and the move towards, um, or, or the the ability of the internet and, the, and these programs, the software, this, this, this AI that allows us to take all this wealth of information and, and create a, a platform that, that we can digest it easier. That's what ChatGPT really is. ChatGPT is not going to necessarily, at the moment probably, um, propose a, a theory that no one's thought about because what it does is it, it sorry what it because what ChatGPT does is it it takes all the existing knowledge and it 
and it regurgitates it to us in a, in a, in a meaningful way. So it's not, it's not a, it's a challenging environment because technology brings with it risks that, that we are not as bankers historically always um, used to. But, but what we do understand as bankers, or what the bankers understand, is that everything is interconnected. And technology is making that interconnectedness more pronounced. And through innovation, you know, you, you start entering new domains which you didn't, which you weren't part of previously. So entering those new domains brings with it new risk sets, new risk environments, which creates new challenges. So without a doubt technology and, and all the all the everything that comes with that. Thank you so much, Prof. And then when it comes to the message of encouragement to new aspiring researchers, what can you say to them? Well, firstly, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think curiosity is important. So if you, if you enjoy reading up on whatever topic that interests you, if you enjoy getting answers, if you are sitting in your mind, in your daily space, wherever you might be at work or at university or studying, whatever, and you've got more questions than answers, you're probably an ideal fit. Research isn't for everyone. It's a lonely game. Um, I probably regard myself as, well, I'm, I'm without a doubt an introvert. I, I, if, I, if I'm around too many people for too long, it drains my energy. So you've probably got to be someone that, that doesn't mind being alone in some contexts, mostly, with regards to sitting down a computer, uh, reading the literature, finding a problem, writing the, the, the paper. That's a lonely process. That doesn't mean that you can't collaborate with other researchers. So, so there are ways to work with other people, for sure. In terms of your question, encouraging people, it's like anything in life. You know, If you don't have a passion for it, you're not going to prosper. Uh, when students come to my office, the first thing, you know, when they ask me what, what should they do in their career, the first thing, my, first thing I ask them is, what do you want to do? It seems like a trivial question. But you have to throw it back at the student. The student answers that question and then you give advice. So if a student wants encouragement with regards to research, you've got to be someone that is a self-starter. Um, no one is going to write that paper. It doesn't just magically appear on a, on a Word document. And, and you've got to be prepared to accept that you're going to get a lot of criticism. We always joke in academia, you know, you've got to become thick-skinned because you, you spend months, sometimes years on a paper, and you think it's the greatest piece of work, and you submit it to a journal, and the reviewers rip it to shreds. You just cannot take that personally. You cannot take it personally. They have their views. What, what often happens is, once you've read the critique and you, you sort of distance yourself from, the, from, from, from it for a few weeks, maybe, or hopefully a few days, even better, a few hours, hopefully, as you become more thick-skinned, you might actually see that what happens nine out of ten times is that most of the critique is justified. So it's a, it's a process of constantly improving, 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 because we are in the game of new knowledge. To claim that you have made a contribution is a, a huge claim. So you have to withstand the critique, and you've got to have a document or a paper that is robust. It, it must be able to withstand criticism. My PhD professor always used to tell me, my supervisor, her role was to shoot holes into my arguments. That's what a supervisor does. So if you take offense to that, in the beginning it's normal to take offense because you take it personally. But you realize that if you've got a good supervisor, they just want to ensure that when it goes for review, after three, four, five years, if it's a PhD, whatever the case might be, that you know that when it's sitting at those reviewers, whatever arguments they have, uh, Hopefully your supervisor had the same problems or concerns, but you've corrected and dealt with it. So ideally what you want is a review that comes back that has minimal comments. Because the process 
from day one until submission was thorough and rigorous and highly critical. I always tell my, my students, keep the first draft of your chapter one. Keep it somewhere in a folder. And don't look at it until the day you submit. And it's, it's, it's fascinating for them to come back to me to see how they've grown because the, the, the level of the, I mean, growth is exponential. Um, so you've got to be someone that, that, uh, that is willing to take the, the, the criticism. Don't take it personally. Um, in terms of encouragement, follow your, your dreams. I mean, life is too short. You can learn one day that you've got health problems and then your life changes. Um, in a, in a post-COVID world, many of us had loved ones that passed away unexpectedly. It might not even be unexpectedly. It might be a family member that, that comes for the weekend and is in a car accident. There's no sense in not following your dreams in this world. The world has become so small with technology. There's no reason why you can't end up living, teaching, doing research, getting a job in any country in the world. Really, that's a, what the internet has done. We're sitting now with a, a consecutive master's degree program in international finance, which my department and the Department of Accounting and Finance at the Salzburg University of Applied Sciences. To our knowledge, it's the first one in our field, in the country, and we have two master's students now that are right now busy with their master's degree there, funded by the Erasmus Plus program, um, and we're so excited about it because we can see, we can see the growth that these students are experiencing because they, they in a different culture, and they are already talking about they thinking of staying on after the year to see if there are opportunities in Europe. We've now got a few students we're looking at for the next cohort uh, that that go to Salzburg in January, and I'm telling you I'm so excited about this because. It's going to change their lives forever. Well, they never thought that they would be in a foreign country. Now they're going to have two master's degrees, one from a South African university, from my department, and another from a, a, a university in Salzburg that, that is um, e excellent in terms of what they offer. What, what they offer, we offer complements the student to become what we, our focus was that the students become better global citizens. That was the main driving force. We can't afford to send our students out into the world that aren't well-rounded global citizens, especially at postgraduate level. So that's our goal. So our, uh, words of, uh, an encouraging word ultimately is don't waste time. If you've got a dream, go for it. Life is too short. When you look again, you're going to be 45 like me. And you're going to you're going to be starting to buy the, you're going to want the Holly Davidsons and the, and the, the, the soft top sports cars because you realize that you're halfway through your, your career and um, you start asking questions, have I done enough in my career because I'm halfway through it? Um, we're all going to go through that. You're going to ask those questions. Don't be in a situation where you are 45 or 50 and you ask yourself, I've been sitting in this job for 20, 30 years and I, I'm not happy. You know, follow your dreams. Life is too short. Thank you so much, Prof. And then coming back to your YouTube channel in relation to the message that you have just said about uh, research. Yeah. And then in that YouTube channel, there is one video where you, you are doing cycling. <laughs> and then it really inspired me and then can you perhaps share with us what the motive behind that? Oh, I'm glad, thank you for watching that video, I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, the YouTube channel, that, that's an interesting story. I've always been someone that enjoys the art of filmmaking. Uh, I, my wife knows, and, I, and I've said it to, to all those that are close to me, I think if I could choose my ideal job besides academia, which I love, 
uh, I'd probably be a movie director or a movie critic. I, I love the art of filmmaking because I, I like the idea that they are trying to get an emotion out of me. And they're doing it through moving pictures, a story. So I, I love watching movies. I love criticizing movies. I love reading up on where it was filmed, how it was filmed, what the budget was. My wife knows when a movie starts, I'm not watching the movie for the first five minutes. I'm on Wikipedia or IMDb and I'm looking at all the stats of the movie. I want to know everything, who the actors were, who their fathers were, who their mothers were, what the budget was, where it was filmed, etc. So in COVID, um, we were sitting at home and technology became the go-to with everything. And uh, I started watching YouTube and I realized, but listen, you don't need a expensive camera to do all these things. You don't need to be a, 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 a graduate from the top film schools in Los Angeles or, or Paris or New York, or whatever. You just need a camera and you need a story. And that excited me. So the first thing that I, that I thought of was, well, I keep, when I do research, or when I supervise in particular, I keep repeating myself. So I thought, well, let me just make a video. And if you've watched the videos, I always apologize for my, my lame sense of humor. I'm still working on that. But I, I try and, I've, I've basically put on videos a, a, lot of, a lot of ideas or challenges that students struggle with in their research. The one that you refer to, in particular, I've always been a keen cyclist. And um, I, was, I teach every year in Salzburg. And uh, last year when I was there in 2002, I decided while, while I was flying to Salzburg, I'm going to cycle a thousand kilometers because I, I've always felt that you know, a, PhD is a, or a PhD is a project. It's a long-term project where you're going to be experiencing ups and downs. And I've, I've done a few Arguses, by no means am I a good cyclist. I enjoy the idea of being out in nature. So don't judge me on my times at the Argus, for example, but I've cycled when I was a student, maybe I did a few thousand kilometers with, with, with friends and, 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 and church groups. And so I've, I've done a fair bit of cycling, um, and, I, and I thought, let me cycle a thousand kilometers. I'm there for three, four weeks. Let me pace it out nicely. There are definitely going to be challenges within in those three, four weeks because I've got a lot of teaching to do. I've got PhD super, supervision students that I need to supervise. Um, I, um, I've got to do my normal work at the university as well, as well as what I do in, in Salzburg. So I, I try to, in a way, illustrate the fact that it's like any project. You can have ups, you can have downs. As soon as you have an up, the next day there's a down. As soon as you have a down, three, four days later, there's an up. Um, and that's the, the message that I try to portray. That I, you know, when I cycled the thousand kilometers, because I had so much time, three odd weeks, I, it was manageable. And the, and the message was, I would not have been able to do it if it was in a week. I had to plan. You know, as, as uh, I watched the, uh, the, the movie you know, uh, King Richard with Will Smith, who won the, the, the Oscar for, for, for Best Actor, you know, and, and while he's training Serena and Venus, on the tennis court at the back, he, there's that, that, that one saying that we often use in, in management sciences, planning, failing to plan is planning to fail. And that's the essence of what a PhD, any research project for that matter is. If you don't plan and you stick to the plan, you're going to get behind and you won't be able, it'll take you longer to catch up. Um, so you need to structure the way you're going to do this thing. That was the idea of it. Except you probably won't sweat as much as what I did going up those hills in the Alps. Uh, probably less of a strenuous environment uh, doing the PhD physically, but by no means is it not a taxing mental exercise, a PhD, and a master's for that, for that matter. So that was my idea with that. The, the YouTube channel is sort of my side hobby. Uh, I, I seem to be getting reasonably good feedback from it. I, that, that's great with me, yeah, as long as it helps the students. Um, because the world of the internet and YouTube, there are many, many, many videos on similar topics. There's no reason why they should watch my videos, uh, but at least I can give a sort of South African perspective.
And um, who would have ever thought that a big guy like me would cycle a thousand kilometers and put it on video and record it? So I enjoy that, that dynamic of it. Thank you so much. And then, apart from research, what are your interests? Well, as I said, I, I enjoy the, this this world of, of of YouTube film video making has sort of opened a whole new world for me. So, in my spare time, I I explore things like sound and editing software and and uh, how to put captions captions on your video. So it's the whole conduit of making a film and make it more interesting. Obviously my, my family, my, my two sons, I, I love spending time with them and, and watching them play sport. They, they seem to be good sportsmen, which without a doubt comes from their mother. Um, she was a great sportsman, so family time is very important to me. Um, not only my immediate family, but my, my parents, my, my in-laws, uh, very important. I think it's, you know, as I said right at the beginning, relationships are vital. And you need to ensure that you have them in good order, as far as you can. Uh, because we go through difficult times and that's when you rely on them. So that, that's another thing. I enjoy, I enjoy exercise. I, cycling is, is, is an important part of my, my uh, exercise routine, as well as, uh, I would say, swimming. I enjoy swimming also. Um, but overall, you know, I like, if I have to sum it up, besides those obvious ones, obviously very important ones, I, I like furthering myself also. You know, I, I read a lot. Um, if it's not reading, I watch videos on, on, on important stuff in my field. So it's not only about reading on what interests me, it's about reading or watching videos on topics that are going to make me better at my job. Not only what Kim Kardashian did, or which I don't watch, but I'm just saying, <laughs> so the younger viewers can understand what I'm referring to. But, uh, but following politics, following different schools of thought, I think it's important as, a, as an academic, you don't just follow your, your uh, group of, of, of your community's views and think that is the be-all and end-all. If you think like that, you mustn't be in academia. You must ensure that you have all the different views and you, you must have, and that, what that does is it creates a more informed final product. If you know what all the arguments are for a particular problem, and you still stick to your view, your thinking and your ability to fight critique is more robust. That's what we want as academics. So when I'm standing in front of a class, um, I always tell my students, I don't care what your view is. You can be totally against me, I don't care. As long as there, there are no fist fights, no blood in this, in the, you know, when we argue with each other, um, I want us to be on different pages of this because it, it makes you a better arguer, it makes you more critical of my view and vice versa. And that's why we are at university. If you didn't want to be in that environment, then you shouldn't be sitting here. So I like reading on contradicting views on many topics. Um, that's important. Other than that, um, I, I, I think I enjoy spending time with my, my family, but alone time. I think I'm a bit of a loner in a certain way, um, which, is, which is probably what you would expect from an academic, most academics probably. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably it. Thank you. Lastly, Prof, uh, looking at uh, the BRICS block, you see now it's attracting other countries. So wh what's your view on that? It's interesting dynamics, isn't it? Because there, there's yes. talk of, of countries like Turkey, Iran, um, maybe some African countries also coming to the party. We'll, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, at the moment, I think it's mostly talk to counter the power of the West. Um, and, and, and I would also argue that a lot of it has to do with the stance of these countries with regards to Russia and Ukraine. Um, so we'll see how that pans out. I think it's too early to to claim or, or um, clearly argue that, or state that there will be more countries because in many ways the BRICS 
group of countries hasn't taken off. You know, I think in many ways it's, it, it's still a pie in the sky. You just have to think back to when uh, our former president fired Khan Khan Nene. Yes. I mean, the obvious claims that he was going to be appointed as the, the chief of the, of the BRICS Bank. I mean, we, are under, we understand the politics behind that and, and, and the state capture dynamic, but, you know, I think that um, we need, there's still a way to go to formalize this group in a way that adds meaningful value. It's, it's still too disjointed um, and it doesn't have the global clout yet to be significant yet. Whether or not that will happen, we'll see because it's not only on economic terms that there needs to be uh, agreement, it's also on political terms. And with the way that the world is moving towards maybe a more nationalist viewpoint with America and, and the Eurozone, you know, it, it, it might be, in a sense, not aligned to what the West is doing, which is what they want on the one hand. But the question is, will it work for all parties? So I think it's still a bit early to preempt where that will go. Um, a, lot, a lot needs to happen with BRICS as a group to make it a, a, a more attractive consideration for these countries, to be meaningfully part of it. Lastly, Prof, we are very thankful for sharing with us. We are inspired by words of wisdom that you have shared with us. It's a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.